some of the issues that uh, uh, Mom Susan has talked about within the, the legal framework. I'm going to quickly map out um, a few pieces of legislation um, enacted or in the process of being enacted so that we can have a better um, understanding of what, what is going on and that we don't see these um, experiences as isolated um, experiences of a, a non-caring or a cruel chief out there. Mm. Um, <clears throat> to a casual observer, um, it's very difficult to actually get a fuller understanding of what this basket of laws means. It's also very difficult um, to a casual, casual observer to understand the significance of the, the King's Origin's claim, um, the standing of the Ngonyama Trust and the vast tracts of property they have, or property that is claimed to be belonging to the Hakabis um, in the Eastern Cape and so on. Also to a casual South African observer, these issues seem like you know, issues to deal with culture and to deal with custom, and therefore we don't get there because you know, it doesn't apply to us. Um, and this has been, I think, the, the most important weapon that government has had for over a decade. Um, that it has relied on this notion of othered people that are out there in rural communities who are actually living according to their culture and custom and, and therefore you can't really be bothered by that. Um, it has also relied on the fact that generally in South Africa, and I think it's a global phenomenon, but that which is beyond our line of vision is taken as non-existent. That is a result of apartheid spatial geography, but is also as a result of um, a, an urban preoccupation um, with our politics, with our society, and, and so on. So in some ways, the apartheid structural um, engineering that put the majority of people in the so-called reserved, in the Bandustans, has actually worked very effectively because it has erased them, continuously erased their humanity, their being, their complexity from mainstream consciousness in society. Um, the, the Constitution, of course, as we know, um, is our point of departure in terms of approach to land, in terms of approach to custom, citizenship, and, and all these issues. So the Constitution affirms the right to custom, customary law, customary systems, and people's chosen cultural identity and, and religion. It is in the Constitution. Um, but the Constitution also says that all these can be exercised subject to equality clause. Subject to equality, you can practice your culture, your religion, subject to the Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. Chapter 12 of the Constitution, taking further uh, this recognition in the Bill of Rights, in the Constitution, um, pays attention to a particular important issue in our society, which is the recognition of traditional leadership. And it, it makes it very clear that Traditional leaders have got to be recognized, their role has got to be affirmed in society and calls, of course, as, as many sections of the Constitution for any legislation that needs to be enacted to facilitate this to be enacted. Now, just quickly to map out, therefore, what has happened. One of the important um, legacies of colonialism and colonial conquest is that the, the logic of colonizers becomes the natural logic 
that people as, you know, assume applies to them. And this is very much the case in terms of the approach to traditional leadership and the approach to custom and customary law and customary systems. It is always very fascinating to me when I hear people talk about and going and prepare to have families, prepare, prepare to have a fallout about the process of mourning and that uzilile, you must wear black clothes, it is our culture and it is our tradition. And you kind of, you know, you step back and you say, but when did it become your tradition? Mm -hmm. Ah, since the time immemorial, you know. And, and in fact, I um, say to people, well, actually, um, it was Queen Victoria who, when her husband died, decided to withdraw from society and decided that she wanted no embellishment in her body. She wanted nothing. She was very sad. And, and that's where this thing is. That's what this custom of yours has become. And, and people look at you and they think, you know, you, you are mad, you are making this up. Um, when Mamsizani talks about the issues of, inher of inheritance and talks about the fact that her mother could not inherit because um, she didn't have a male heir, you know, in KZN, in Eastern Cape and everywhere else where I come, uh, where, 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 you know, places where you are familiar with, people accept this notion of male uh, primogeniture as if it is our culture. This notion of the male head of household, it is our culture, it is who we are. And when you step back and you say, well, actually, the notion of a single head of household, male or female, actually came with British colonialism. And the notion of a male head of household is a British colonial concept that in my family, in the place where I come from, no individual owns land or property, but that they hold it in trust. And they hold it in trust and in custody to the extent that they can be able to discharge the responsibility of that trust and that custody. So the notion that one individual has got all these powers that are vested in him is in, is in itself a colonial construct. Um, this has, of course, uh, filtered in so many different ways, including notions of traditional leadership and notions of kingship. In 2003, in trying to figure out what to do with the constitutional promise of, 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 um, of recognition of traditional leaders, um, a, a very problematic piece of legislation was enacted. And this is where our problem in post-apartheid South Africa starts. And it is called the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act. If we had a PowerPoint here, you would see how the definition of the traditional communities mirrors the definition, the, those areas that were identified as bandustans. So the notion of physical boundaries, the notion of tribal identity chosen or imposed as, as determining where you belong has been reintroduced in South Africa in 2003. Ostensibly, um, interestingly, in an attempt to do away with a whole range of laws that were introduced by apartheid um, government in the in, 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 at, you know, at earlier part of the last century. Now, the traditional, the, the, traditional look, the traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act of 2003, TLGFA of 2003, was very, very difficult to challenge because it seemed as if you know, they were just marking territory and we were not sure what powers really would be um, in real sense. I would like to encourage everybody to actually read that act, and it's a very longish act, and read chapter two of the final chapter of that, and see the kind of powers from control of land, control of resources, and all that, that are given to traditional leaders. The second um, legacy that we see uh, is also this notion of standardization of customary law. This notion that all Africans have got one system and which also comes from a codified 
um, customary law um, a system where you go for the common denominator and you take it as frozen in time and you apply it to people. The third aspect of it is this the notion of identities, tribal, cultural, and whatever, that are imposed on people by virtue of where they are located. Now, all these things seem not to make sense when you look at them in isolation, and that is why it was difficult to challenge the uh, TLGFA of 2003, because until we could see what was, what was happening. So fast forward very quickly, I'm going to finish now, uh, Fazla. Thereafter comes the Communal Land Rights Act, um, which basically began to give concretely, in a very concrete sense, the right of ownership of land, the right that traditional leaders have never heard in many African customary systems. Where I come from, the kinds of powers and influence and space that traditional leaders claim. I listen to Kondralesa and I just like roll out laughing because except that it's very dangerous. You know, you have issues around initiation and then they say, yeah, but they must give it to us. If they give it to us, we can sort this thing out because we are in fact custodians of culture. Uh, where I come from, traditional leaders have got nothing to do with whether my brother is initiated or not. Um, it is a matter of the family and it is a matter of of the clan, and it is a matter of the community, stay the people with whom which we eat. Traditional leaders have got nothing to do with whether I get married, whether Lobolo is paid, or whether I get pregnant. In other parts of the country, as we speak, when women, when young women, teenagers, get pregnant, or unmarried women get pregnant, in some instances, traditional leaders fine the parents, especially the mothers, and say, you have brought disgrace into this community. All of this is, is, a, is a pollution. And, and I have a bit of a problem in talking about pollution because when one talks about pollution, there's an assumption that there was something pure in the first place. Now, finally, we can, I can trace a whole range of laws. Uh, 2010, the Communal Land Rights Act was struck down because it gave so much power to traditional leaders. And in fact, it was seen as unconstitutional. However, the Constitutional Court, um, did not go into the substantive debates about what it was. So it was struck um, on technical grounds. Nevertheless, if it, go, if, you know, if it came to substantive issues, it still would not pass. Um, building on the system, and the system has been, so first you, you, you mark out territory, and you say, Nina, Ninga, Batswana, this is where you belong, and that is where you are stuck, and this is your, these are your rigid, apartheid boundaries, these are your rigid cultural boundaries, which in fact are exactly as the apartheid boundaries. And these are your chiefs, these are the people that you account to. Then you, it, we come to a second layer. The second layer says, yeah, but now traditional leadership, you know, is, is actually very able to lobby government in this country for a whole range of reasons and we can go into that. And then they come in and they say, yeah, but now you, give, you gave us this thing and you know the local uh, government undermines us and we don't really have control over our land. Of course, you can have a conversation about when, when did you actually have control in the first place. But nevertheless, so the Communal Land Rights Act comes, the traditional courts bill comes, and which basically says that you will also be responsible for administering justice in this area. You will develop customary law according to custom. You will um, ensure that there are all these powers. Again, I encourage people to go and read that and see the kind of powers that they have. And it is very easy for us to say, yeah, but justice is not accept, uh, accessible to people in rural communities. Therefore, maybe traditional courts should be allowed. We can have a conversation about that. Now, finally, the, the, the piece of legislation, and I'll take only two minutes, that I want to come to is the amendment of the Land, Land Restitution Rights Act that was signed by President Zuma last year, I mean, the early this year. We saw President Zuma um, in February addressing the National House of Traditional Leaders, and as he always does, our dear president, diverted from his written speech and said to traditional leaders, I encourage you to put together the best resources that you can come up with. Get the best lawyers that you can have so that you can put in claims 
for people, for your people. So we have, as a result, yes, it is the president who actually encouraged this. Um, so we have, as a result, these huge claims. Now we look at King Zolitini's claim, um, we look at the Khakhabe claim in the Eastern Cape, they claim from Middle Drift right up to the Cape together with a group of, um, of, 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 of the Khoi and the Sen. We also have another claim in KZN, in another part of KZN, which also includes a group of the Khoi and the Sen and so on. So you have this parceling of out of land. Now the interesting thing that I want to leave you with is that all these claims predate 19, uh, go into an era that predates 1913. And then you have to ask yourself, but why is, why are these people bold to go and why is King Zolitini um, actually making claims that go as far as 1835? Because, and you think, well, I mean, this is foolhardy because the constitution remains, are they going to change the constitution? Actually, they are not going to change the constitution. Um, it has taken me a long time to try and figure this out. They are going to get this land on the basis of heritage. So it means that if I, as the child of the Kusana clan, had land somewhere that also is as important to me as all these vast tracts of land that are being claimed, but I probably will not be able to fulfill the requirement that says it is in the interest of the heritage of anybody uh, beyond myself. And what it does is that it gives us an idea of how property and how land is going to be accumulated by a few in the name of land resti uh, uh, restitution. They, we can discuss later other reasons um, for this. Suffice to say that the land claims also take place at a time when the geographical location of wealth especially the extractive wealth and minerals in this country is changing. It is no longer what was traditionally called, what was called South Africa in the apartheid period. It is in what was called the Bandustans. And you look at Northwest, for example, you look at KZN, where Ingonyama Trust is, there are vast tracts of land there that still have coal that is unexplored and that is unmined. So on the one hand, we can say that there's political expediency, there's playing into the rural vote and chiefs and, and, and all of that so that the ANC can continue to have control. But actually even that would be a very limited understanding. An understanding of what King Zolitini's claim, what the Chachabe claim, what um, the, the Tembu claim to some extent, yeah, well, the Tembu claim because they're going to have a fight about how far his land goes. All these things go back to a control for accumulation of resources to ensure that what we have today in South Africa, which is a, a triumvirate that controls the wealth in this country, that is the huge multinational companies with the assistance of the black elite, particularly the traditional leaders um, and, and government, that that system is going to be re-entrenched re, re, um, re and that that system is going to be solidified. And in the final analysis, what we are seeing is new forms of dispossession in the name of addressing the historical dispossessions. Uh, it's a very short time, it's a very complicated conversation, but I hope that that gives you some kind of picture that here we are not talking about smaller nyana thing that happens there with some little king who doesn't have, uh, with some little chief who doesn't have feeling for his people. And we also have to bear in mind that Ingonyama Trust itself is a dirty deal that was done on the eve of transformation, of, of, of transition in 1994. This was the parcel, it was the gift, this was a parting gift that the nets gave to, Inga, to, 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 to King Zolitini in order to pacify Ingata Freedom Party. And everybody, including the ANC, thought that this was some small thing, you know, give them that little bit there and they'll keep quiet. 
And the liquor pit has become a monster. And it is a monster that is very difficult to actually control. But most importantly, if you look at the huge amount of land that Ingonyama Trust has, and if you look at the huge amount of resources that Ingonyama Trust have, you realize that the monster is not just a monster that benefits the elite that goes with King Zolitini. It is a monster that also the new political elite and the old political elite and the old wealthy white people in this country continue to, to have these relationships so that the elite can have these relationships. It is going to be at the expense of the rights of people. It is going to be at the expense of the citizenship of people. And you also see it mirrored in small and large ways. You simply have to look at the wild coast and the mess that is happening there um, as a result of titanium and, and all these kinds of things. And, and you see that there is no consideration for rights, for env environment, for the future of this country. What we have is an extractive um, society and an extractive um, industry that in fact, despite all the money that you get from AgriSA and all the money that you get from multinationals, in the end they are all in cahoots with government and they are in cahoots with their um, traditional leaders. Thanks very much.